Welcome to Apologia and another edition of Ham and Egg News, where we react to Ken Ham reacting to things. You may recall that in our previous video, Uncle Bobby showed up to help, but tapped out halfway through the Answers News episode. So it's nice to get some new good news every now and again. Oh God, there's more of this crap. Holy shit. We can be done. We can be done. <laughs> that was plenty of coverage. Plenty. But since a Ken Ham hosted show is so rare these days, I feel like I should just move on from that point and cover the back half on my own. Roll it. And that, that leads in well to the next article too, doesn't it? It does. So this one is actually a bit of good news. So it's nice to get some good news every now and again. Christian photographer beats city in court, won't be forced to work same-sex weddings. And so I retitled this, Religious Freedom Gets a Win. Hey, Canada, uh, do you want a little help on this one? Because these people do not know what they are talking about. Oh my goodness, I'm so happy you're here, Andrew. This, yes, yeah, please. The whole American politics thing confuses and frustrates us greatly. So yes, please. Okay, so first of all, this is not a win for religious freedom, this case that they're talking about here. This is a complete perversion of religious freedom. They are weaponizing religious freedom to violate other people's rights. It, it, this case is a disgrace. What they're Sorry talking about, about here is violating civil rights laws. And they are acting like this is a good thing and a vindication for religious freedom. And this uh, photographer was not wanting to work weddings for same-sex couples because it violated uh, her Christian beliefs. And so she's taken to court uh, on that. And actually, they put an ordinance over in Louisville, Kentucky, that you actually, it's called the Fairness Ordinance. All right, so let's talk about the Fairness Ordinance here, because this is crucial. The Fairness Ordinance is a civil rights law. And it is a law that says businesses cannot discriminate against customers in protected classes. So it's really important to understand exactly how these laws operate because most people don't. And clearly these three people talking on stage have no idea how these laws operate. Or if they do, they are deliberately misleading everybody in the audience. The basic idea behind every civil rights law that we have here in the country is simple. It's don't discriminate. When you open a business, you cannot discriminate against certain classes of people. So every civil rights law lists groups of people that are protected, and then they list businesses, places, and services and the like that can't exclude those people. So the groups of people are known as protected classes. You know, a typical civil rights law might say those classes include people based on disability, race, creed, color, sex, sexual orientation, marital status, national origin, things like that. We have federal civil rights laws that do this. We have state civil rights laws that do this. And then we also have local civil rights laws that do this. And what they do is they establish clear legal rights for people. And this business, again, this is a business. It's a photography business, okay? It's, it's not a person. It's a limited liability corporation. If you actually go read the caption on this case, it's Chelsea Nelson Photography LLC versus Louisville. Right. So this is a business suing to claim that they have a religious freedom right to not follow civil rights laws because they want to discriminate against LGBTQ people. This news program that we're looking at right now is just <laughs> down the road in Kentucky. And if you go to the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum, if you want to serve French fries or sweep the floors, you have to sign a statement of faith saying that you are not gay and that you will not have sex outside of marriage and that you believe that the earth is 6,000 years old. How can Ken Ham get away with that if he's literally down the road from this shop? It's a really good question. And one of the reasons is that these civil rights laws often exempt religious organizations from those statutes. So for instance, if you're the Catholic church, you're only going to put men in your hierarchy. We have exempted churches and certain religious organizations from the civil rights statutes. What these statutes really apply to is places of public accommodation, businesses, places where you'll go sit and eat, watch a play or a movie theater. And these, these civil rights laws come out of the civil rights movement. They come out of Jim Crow. This is how we stopped segregation. Martin Luther King 
wrote this really remarkable letter that I read every MLK day, which is in January. It's the letter from the Birmingham jail. And in it, he lists the injustices that black people endure, such as driving long distances and being forced to quote, sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your car because no motel would accept you. And then being constantly humiliated by those nagging signs reading white and colored. And then the one thing that he wrote about that really stuck with me and that I think sticks with every parent, he writes about how he finds his tongue twisted and he's stammering for speech because he's trying to explain to his six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the amusement park that was just advertised on TV, Funtown, because Funtown doesn't let in black kids. He talks about seeing the tears welling up in her eyes because Funtown is closed to kids that look like her. And then he says, it talks about the ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky. So th this is the harm that civil rights laws are trying to stop, right? It's not just the harm in denying a motel room or an amusement park or denying a cake. It's a harm in denying a person's humanity and the incalculable damage of implanting that heinous sense of inferiority in a child's impressionable mind. I mean, that is real and enduring harm. And the fact that it's mental harm doesn't make it any less real, even if it is difficult to quantify. If you are told that you are inferior every time you go out in public, that exacts a debilitating price, much greater than physical harm. Though the physical harm can be brutal too. I mean, imagine sleeping in the corners of your car, you know, that may not seem too bad. I'm here in Wisconsin, you're up in Canada. You, I mean, you can imagine sleeping in your car in a winter. I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, or, no, thank or imagine you're stuck sleeping in your car somewhere in the South in the 1950s, 40s, oh, 30s, man. 60s, and you know you have the KKK roaming the night. What if it's something more serious? What if you're denied groceries or food or baby formula or gas? Or what if you're denied medical care? In American history, every business across entire swaths of the American landscape discriminated. You know, not just single stores or, or hotels or bakeries or photographers, but every business would discriminate and force black people to go elsewhere. And often there was no elsewhere. So that is why we have these laws. That is where they come from. This is the harm that they are trying to address. By the way, we also happen to know that these laws work. In American Crusade, one of the things that shook me most was in the whole bakery case that was infamous and we've actually talked about on this show in the years past you had a statement from the initial victims regarding how it affected them i assumed it was always just oh you didn't get your cake baked for you so yeah you could have shuffled down the street but they were with their mothers am i remembering that correctly how did that go you on are. that victim impact yeah. So this is the, the gay wedding ca case out of Colorado that people remember the Supreme Court decided a while ago. And this is Charlie Craig and Dave Mullins. This is a gay couple in Colorado. They've been together for two years and they were kind enough and trusted me enough to share their story with me after the case had been decided. I was the first person to really go interview them after the Supreme Court decided against them and in favor of this bakery. And I talked to them for hours and hours and hours, and they told me their story. And basically, they, they had been planning their wedding. They decided on almost everything. They were actually technically already married when they were doing this. And they come into the bakery, and one of their moms is with them. He greets them warmly, and they sit down to look at photos of custom cakes that he has baked for other folks. But then there's this moment where the owner realizes that Charlie and Dave are planning their own wedding to each other. And then he says, Well, I, I'm not going to sell you. A wedding cake. So Charlie and Dave never got the chance to ask for anything. They just sat down. He asked what the cake was for. They said, it's for us. And then he immediately said, I won't make a cake for your same sex wedding. And they describe it as this gigantic yawning pregnant pause. And they left feeling hurt and humiliated and marginalized. And it was Charlie's mom who was in town with them and who visited it. And she says it was the one thing that she got to do with them in planning their wedding. She was excited for this and she didn't understand what was happening. She gave an interview later on where she said, we went into the store happy and we left feeling broken. But Charlie was telling me she didn't really understand what was happening right away. And they actually had to explain it to her, um, no, which was man. just this, this sort of like this extra insult, right? Like we had to explain to her that the bakery owner understood what we were asking for. And that was why we were being discriminated against, you know, and, and Charlie grew up in this small town in Wyoming where it was not okay to be gay, where he's growing up in the shadow of this hideous murder of Matthew Shepard, the 21 year old gay man attending the University of Wyoming at Laramie, who was just 
abducted and tortured and brutally murdered and set on fire and left tied to a fence to die. That moment for them was awful. They were denied their humanity in a very public way. And I talked with both of them a, a lot about how it felt. And I don't want to put words in their mouth. I would really encourage everybody to go pick up a copy of American Crusade. This chapter in the book is one of the chapters that I am most proud of having written. It was incredibly impactful to me because I had been looking at this very clinically. And I'm, this case they're talking about on screen is very similar. So I'm sure we'll get to some of that. But the forgetting that there are humans behind these cases is something that I think that we, the public do. And I think it almost like the Supreme Court, it seems like these days is forgetting as well. But let's see what yeah. the answers in Genesis crew wants to say about weddings. That would require her, literally require her to work same-sex weddings, thus violating her religious beliefs, her First Amendment rights and stuff like that. And so she took it to court and eventually the court sided with her. Okay. So, so that, this is crazy too, because unlike the bakery case, this photography business preemptively sued. So. There was no couple that came in and said, hey, we would like you to shoot our wedding. And then she said, oh, I can't. I'm a Christian. That violates my religious beliefs. She is challenging the civil rights statute and trying to strike down the civil rights law without ever having denied it or ever having a threat of enforcement against her. And again, it, this is not her, right? This is a for-profit right. business that is organized and operating under the laws of Kentucky, not an individual person. And this business was not worshiping or praying. This business was not being asked to get gay married, whatever that might mean. The business was open and operating for anybody to join in. And, and this is a crucial piece that really gets missed whenever we talk about these cases is that these are businesses, right? Like if right. Charlie and David had approached the individual, like gone to his house and knocked on his door and said, Hey, I want you to, sure. we want you to yeah, make yeah. a gate. Obviously he has a right to say no. Same thing for the photographer here. You know, they go to her house and say, Hey, we want you to take photos of us, or they hear about her through a friend, whatever. But that's not what is happening. This is a business and it's protected under all kinds of laws. It's, it's, it's an LLC, I assume. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. And that's so crucial because that means limited liability corporation. And what that means is that the corporation, this legal entity is different than the person who owns it. That's the whole reason you set up a limited liability corporation. So like, let's say you're a photographer and you take pictures at a wedding and I don't, disaster strikes and you know, your hard drives are all erased and you lose all the photos. Okay. Your business is liable for that damage. Let's say you're a baker and you bake a cake that poisons 50 people at the wedding. Okay your business is liable for that damage. And that's happened. You as a person are not, right? Your personal right. assets, your house, your kid's college savings account, your car, all of that is protected because the limited liability corporation is different than you, the individual. The whole purpose of setting up a limited liability corporation is to separate your business from your person. I'm assuming the reason the government wants to do that is to encourage entrepreneurship that might be too risky for an individual to. Exactly. Know. I mean, I, I, right. I'm, I'm, like the entire American commercial system depends on this corporate separateness. It really, really does. This is a fundamental principle of American business. And there's a really great brief written in Charlie and David's case by 30 corporate law professors who explain this. This is the sine qua non. You know, I, I hate it when lawyers use Latin, but the point being, it's impossible to overstate how important this separation is. And it's just completely ignored by not only the Supreme Court in Charlie and David's case, but by the court in this case, right? Again, this is not an individual photographer who's doing this. This is a limited liability corporation that's protected. And that separation apparently doesn't apply to religious freedom, which is crazy. So they want to have their cake and eat it too if we're mixing the cases here. Exactly. It's one of the things that just gets completely overlooked in these cases. And in my mind, it can be the end of it. But, you know, this happened in the Hobby Lobby case too. And in the Hobby Lobby case, it's even worse because you have the Green family, which are the beneficiary of a series of trusts. And those trusts own stock in the limited liability corporations that are Hobby Lobby and Martell and all this stuff. And then those companies employ all these people. So you have multiple layers of separation and it protects them again, not just from liability, but from all kinds of other things too, like having to pay taxes on their stuff. And they reap all of the benefits of the separation. But then when it comes time to have one burden, oh, you have to follow right. a civil rights law. They say, oh, we can't possibly do that. 
can't possibly do that. And so you get this yearning for discrimination. So, I mean, so far we've found out one, they're fighting against civil rights laws. Two, they're ignoring the fact that this photographer is not this business. Right. And I, I mean, we'll get into more, but three, that the point of this lawsuit is to discriminate. And it's really crucial that she's trying to challenge the whole law without ever having been enforced because there's no reason a court should be deciding this. You don't get to challenge a speed limit if you didn't get a speeding ticket. That's not the way our system works here in the United States. You have to be actually impacted by the law. And she hasn't been in any way, shape or form. But because this court, this Trump appointee wants to decide this case, he's taking it. This is Judge Beaton in Kentucky. Anyway, just, it's that whole American thing that we're, we're not used to where the Supreme mm -hmm. Court gets to also just decide which cases to take and which ones not to, which is the whole thing. But yeah. we'll, we'll get into it. Freedom of speech issues yeah. and free exercise of religion, but it takes years. And a lot of people don't even do it because it costs too much money. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are blessed to have organizations like the Alliance Defending Freedom and First Liberty. And okay, so this is worth talking about. My new book is called American Crusade, How the Supreme Court is Weaponizing Religious Freedom. And the two groups that he mentioned there, Alliance Defending Freedom and First Liberty Institute, are crusaders. They are two of the primary groups that are working to weaponize religious freedom, to turn it from this hallowed protection into a weapon, literally a weapon to impose their religion on other people, to in impose conservative Christianity on other people. Like this photographer being able to impose it on any gay couple in the Kentucky area through this limited liability corporation that she's created. And these groups are part of this really wealthy, influential network of crusaders that are working to try to weaponize religious freedom. Alliance Defending Freedom also brought the gay wedding cake case that we've been talking about. First Liberty Institute brought a number of cases, including a few last term, including the case of the coach that was imposing his prayer on students at high school football games and a case out of Maine where it essentially turned one of our founding principles on its head. For the longest time in this country, we've understood that you cannot tax a citizen and then turn around and give that money to a church or to a religion because doing so would violate the religious freedom of that taxpayer. This is a very old principle. It goes back to, I mean, Thomas Jefferson wrote about it. He called it sinful and tyrannical. This is basically government enforced tithing. And the Supreme Court, in a case that First Liberty Institute brought alongside Institute for Justice last term, turned that principle on its head and said, yeah, you have to fund conservative Christian education and indoctrination. And in both cases, the schools in Maine are like these terrible anti-LGBTQ schools. ADF was started as this awful anti-LGBTQ body. So all of these are really tied together in this shadowy network with all of this really gross anti-LGBT. The roots of it really go to segregation, which is why they're challenging civil rights laws. And I definitely want to get into the race issues here. But so often these groups have ties, early ties to, for instance, James Dobson, who is, you know, this anti-gay He's a white Christian with he and he had early racist and eugenics leanings. A lot of the groups were started with Koch brothers seed money, uh, cash infusions from the DeVos empire are typical. So this is this is a huge network. We've done billions of dollars in revenue that I explain and explore in the book. And one of the things they don't just bring these cases, they've also worked to capture the courts so that they have now the groups that take these cases and set them up and then the judges to decide the cases that have been set up, right? So we'll set them up, you knock them down. So they're playing both sides. They've essentially captured the entire system. And that's why you can see in the case that they're talking about here on stage, even though this law has not been attempted to be enforced against the photography business at all, the business is still able to challenge it because essentially they've rigged the system. The way you describe it, I understand that if you're just listening to this video on YouTube, that that's going to sound very Illuminati and you even oh, use yeah. the word shadowy in there. I will say the American Crusade, though, lays out, I don't know if we have time for it now, but you definitely lay out a bunch of cases that are very mm -hmm. obvious that they're not just playing defense. They are definitely playing offense. I think you lay out that super clear in your book. I'd be the first to admit there were many, many times when I was writing American Crusade where I felt like the Charlie Day meme, the guy in the basement <laughs> with the cigarette butt and the red yarn and stuff plastered all over the wall. I get it. And it's, it's hard to recognize like how much has been done. But let me give you an example, because I, I think a lot of people don't understand how bad it truly is. So I mentioned that the capture of our courts, but this was a hostile takeover of the federal judiciary. I mean, it truly was. And so Leonard Leo, for the people in the know on this, is kind of universally recognized as the guy 
who orchestrated that hostile takeover, of, especially of the Supreme Court. And so I have a quote for, in the book of this former employee who described Leonard Leo's mission like this, quote, he figured out 20 years ago that conservatives had lost the culture war, abortion, gay rights, contraception. Conservatives didn't have a chance if public opinion prevailed. So they needed to stack the courts. And that's what they did. Notice that they're admitting the anti-democratic goals there, right? Like, if we don't stack the courts, the majority is going to rule. If we don't stack the courts, democracy is going to work. We can't have that. And we know, yeah. we know that Leo's groups, his various groups, the Federalist Society, Judicial Crisis Network, et cetera, they spent $540 million packing the court from 2014 to 2020. That's from blocking Merrick Garland, who was Obama's nominee to fill a seat, Scalia's seat, right. blocking him all the way up through putting Amy Coney Barrett on the court. And this summer, the news broke that Leonard Leo's newest group raised 1.6 billion, that's billion with a B, in one wow. single donation. That's a billion dollars more than he spent capturing the court. So you'll learn about Leo's new well-funded work in the update to American Crusade, which is actually available to free online on my website for anybody who buys the book. And just to wrap this up, Leo's job for the last almost 20 years was to find these conservative legal activists who would make good judges. I mean, this is why the Federalist Society was created. He was described as, quote, the monitor of the nominee's ideological purity. Right? So we're, we're talking about judicial nominees there. The monitor of the nominee's ideological purity. People may remember that Donald Trump released short lists of judges that he would nominate to the Supreme Court. Leonard Leo wrote those lists. All told, we know for a fact that Leo is responsible for the confirmation of Chief Justice John Roberts, Sam Alito, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. That, that is five members of the Supreme Court. Clarence Thomas is an old friend of Leo's. All six of those justices were members or are members of the Federalist Society. You know, that there's actually a video of Thomas and Leo joking on stage at a Federalist Society event just a couple of years ago about how Leo is the third most powerful man in America, right? So, I mean, th that's six votes on the Supreme Court. And Leo personally chose five of them for their ideology. And it is a crusader ideology. And the midterms are coming up in a few days. Mm -hmm. Now it's my understanding, I could be totally wrong with this as the Canadian, it's my understanding that Congress is in charge of the number of people who are on the Supreme Court. Is that correct? That is correct. That and is then correct. it's my understanding also that Congress has disproportionately decided during these midterms. Is that also correct? That is also that? that No, that is also correct. Yeah, okay, so it. this humble Canadian just, I guess, would implore everyone in a few days, your midterms are coming up. If you haven't mm -hmm. already voted in advanced polling, obviously, these are all the reasons why it's incredibly important that you do that. V voting is absolutely crucial. I, I also like to tell people voting is literally the least you can do. And I mean that sincerely. Voting at best gives us a chance to create the change that we want. It doesn't make the change. You're not doing some magic instant gratification when you go into that ballot box and cast your vote. All you are doing is creating the possibility that we could progress, that we could make progressive change. You're not actually making it. It's a prerequisite if you want some sort of progressive change and want to stop barreling down the path that we are currently on where, you know, we've seen the end of Roe versus Wade. We know they're coming for gay marriage and marriage equality. We know they're coming for contraception. There is no amount of power or privilege that is going to satisfy the religious extremists and Christian nationalists. Voting is literally the least you can do. I would encourage everybody to get out there and do a lot more. You can go to Vote Save America and volunteer. You could donate, you can text bank, you can phone call, you can go knock on doors. We are up against an authoritarian movement in this country. I know a lot of people out there feel like voting is pointless or doesn't work or that it, it's not enough. And I can tell you as a constitutional lawyer who's been doing this work for more than a decade, conservatives are desperately trying to take away your right to vote. They don't want you to vote. And there's a reason for that because it does work. It is the only voice you have. You absolutely have to use it. Don't let them win and take away your vote because you are apathetic. Other organizations the past. that are out there, yeah, we've worked with both of those groups that have helped us uh, in the past. Not surprised. Not surprised that they've yeah, worked you... with them. <laughs> Answers to Genesis has a long history of litigation that yeah. uh, I don't think we have time for today, but... <laughs> There's some previous cases of theirs that are hilarious. So. Yeah. I have a long history with Mr. Ham myself. He's a... Oh, that's right. You do. He, uh, <laughs> he doesn't like you very much. No, he doesn't like me very much. My old organization, I shot a commercial 
at the Ark Park. If the religious right remains unchecked, science-based education will be history. This will be the classroom of the future, Ken Ham's Ark Park in Northern Kentucky. So with millions in taxpayer subsidies on land that the government basically gave to him. He was not a fan of that. Yeah, and he went after <laughs> me a number of times by name. I believe it was Andrew Siddell, the attorney for okay. Freedom from Religion Foundation, who wrote this. He's, he's the same one that, that uh, published all those lies about the Ark Encounter and yeah. they attack the Creation Museum. Well, if you can't fact, trust them in one area, in why fact, would you trust they attack anyone another? Christian. That is the policy of Ham and Egg News. Anyone whose name is on Ken Ham's lips is welcome here anytime. <laughs> you know, here at the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, we've had people who are very obviously uh, gay. Or they even make sure they let people know who've come to the Ark and the Creation Museum. But we want everyone to come to the Creation Absolutely. Museum and the Ark. We, we don't want, want to turn people away. We want them to hear the truth of God's Word and the Gospel. Yeah, so it's really, really interesting. Like that little dig at LGBTQ people for being open about who they are i mean <laughs> dude you built a massive boat in the middle of nowhere to, to be open and convert people to who you are you get a little bit of self-awareness there ken he also lights it up with a rainbow every night so i don't think he gets the optics of what's going on <laughs> that what the K kentucky uh the county here was doing was trying to impose on someone that you have to support uh, a particular worldview. That's a, fl a flat out lie, right? Because again, these are civil rights statutes. Th these are the laws that prevent businesses from putting up signs that say no Jews allowed or no blacks allowed. These laws are, are absolutely crucial and they, they truly are about fairness and anti-discrimination. And one thing that I think is absolutely crucial for people to understand here is that if they win their arguments all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court's actually hearing a case this term called 303 Creative versus Alenis, which is almost identical to this particular case. It's a website designer challenging a similar statute. The website designer has never been asked to design a gay website, but is challenging the law anyway. And the Supreme Court's gonna decide that case this term. And I think they're gonna decide that yes, you have a free speech right to violate civil rights laws. But if you go back and listen to the oral argument in Charlie and David's case, in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, it becomes very clear on all sides that there is no way to end the discrimination against just LGBTQ people. Not that that would be okay, but what I'm saying is once you allow a person to claim that the civil rights statutes no longer apply to them because they are a Christian or because they don't wanna say something, even though it's a business, not them personally, there's no way to say, okay, that only applies to LGBTQ people. You're only allowed to discriminate right. against LGBTQ people. We are absolutely going to see a revival of anti-Semitism, which is happening right now in this country, and white supremacy using this exact same argument. And there is nothing that we will be able to do to stop them when the court adopts that. And again, if you don't believe me, either pick up a copy of American Crusade, I break down the oral argument in there, or go listen to it for yourself that constantly the justices are asking, oh, how are we, if we allow you to discriminate against this LGBTQ couple, can't you discriminate against an interracial couple? Can't you discriminate against somebody because of their race? And every time there is no answer. They do not have an answer because the line that is appropriate to draw is between discrimination and anti-discrimination. You cannot discriminate. Once you allow it, you can't draw a line between the different kinds of discrimination and say one is okay and one's not. It's just not going to happen. And as I understand it, the Supreme Court said that atheism is a protected class in the same classes as some of those others. So theoretically, you could also discriminate against atheists, I'm guessing, down the oh. line if we're slippery sloping. I mean, a absolutely. I would expect that to happen pretty soon. A year or so after the masterpiece, the cake shop, Case, Charlie and David's case, I was actually in Mississippi. I believe it was called Boone's Camp. There's this wedding venue. It made headlines because it refused to rent to an interracial couple. And the owner said, we don't do gay weddings or mixed race weddings because of our Christian belief. And, you know, you know the story exploded and eventually the owner had to reverse course. But their Christianity motivated their anti-Black and their anti-LGBTQ bigotry. And there's no way 
to draw a distinction between those two things. And, and you can actually hear the other, the conservative justices are like really angry about that fact. In the case, John Roberts says something like the racial analogy is obviously very compelling, but he objected to decent and honorable religious bigots who oppose LGBTQ equality being lumped in with the bigots who oppose racial equality, right? As if there's some kind of difference. So anyway, that is on the horizon. I think it's less a slippery slope than an inevitable outcome. With your business, you're gifts, your yeah. abilities, your talents. And, and you've got to help promote them. Well, that's a different matter entirely. They make a distinction between serving them, um, like in a restaurant or through your services, um, but speech is categorically different. Well, again, she is serving them. She's serving as their photographer. She is offering photography services for weddings. And first of all, again, has not been asked to provide them by anybody. I'm actually a photographer. Before I went to law school, I was a reasonably accomplished amateur nature photographer. And I did weddings because weddings pay the bills. And like, yes, I try to get good photos. And yes, I am artistic when I do those, but they are hiring me to do a job and they are paying me to do a job. And I'm putting myself out there and it is perfectly acceptable if I'm going to claim protection under the laws of the state of Colorado or Kentucky or whatever, for that state to also say, okay, but you also have to follow these other laws. So again, this conflation of free speech and services, I think is a little frustrating. On this very program I've advocated in the past that for me, I did see some kind of nuance between, you know, someone who's making a website that there is more creativity and personal stuff put into it than selling you a donut or renting chairs to you or something. So you're saying essentially under the law. That is not a meaningful nuance or a meaningful difference. I think there can be, but put like imagine something that's like pure speech. Like imagine a speech writer. Okay, like I like if I hire you to be a speech writer mm -hmm. for me, I'm going to tell you like I want you to say this. We're going to work together to put together my message. And now maybe you don't think you'll be a good person to do that, and maybe you don't think you have the background to do it, or maybe you think that your personal biases would make you bad. At it. Fine, you can say all that. What you can't do is say. I do not serve you because you are LGBTQ. I don't serve gay people. That's what happened in the Colorado gay wedding cake case. Um, again, the only thing that Baker found out, the only new piece of information he had was, oh, you two are gay. I'm not going to serve you. Again, there was no question about what was on the cake or anything like that. And in these other two cases that we have coming up, including the one they're talking about here, there's no question about what they've been asked to design because it hasn't happened, right? Right. So to take an analogy for the gay wedding cake. What does a gay wedding cake look like? If I show you a wedding cake and it is three white tiers of cake, is that a gay cake or a right. straight cake? Look, there's no speech that really makes that clear. Now, maybe you do get that like for a website design, but it's also going to be, hey, I want you to design a website. And I just did this for my personal website when the new book came out. I provided all of the copy for it. People weren't mm. writing it for me. And if they are writing it for you, again, you know, you're going over it with them. If they are holding themselves out to provide speech services, I think it is different. I'm not saying it's an easy question necessarily, but I do think it's not the same as a pure individual person's speech the way we've seen it in the past. And I think one of the quotes in here was the freedom of speech, especially for minority views, is a core premise of our democratic republic. And, you know, it's just, I think mm -hmm. to your point earlier, you know, it's sad that we're becoming the minority. Like mm -hmm. one of the questions I ask in American crusade is why is there this crusade to weaponize religious freedom? Why are they so desperate to take this protection and try to turn it into a weapon. And the answer to that question really is that they are raging against the dying of their privilege. The crusade is this backlash against equality realized. Conservative white Christian American status as the dominant group in this country is under threat because equality is progressing and because demographics are changing. And so it was really fascinating for me to hear them talking explicitly about their version of religious freedom, which is really religious privilege, the, the, the weaponized version of religious freedom, and then tying it directly to the reason that I identify that they are weaponizing it in my new book, American Crusade. It's like, oh, thank you for proving my point. I really appreciate that. <laughs> you know, yeah. we used to be a, a, based on God. Our country was founded on, on the Christian faith. And so. Okay. All right. I <laughs> <laughs> That's also just flat out wrong. So I, I wrote American Crusade, how the Supreme Court is weaponizing religious freedom. And that came out a month ago. But my first book is called The Founding Myth, 
why Christian nationalism is un-American. And it is all about debunking that sentence that she just uttered. She could not be more wrong about that. You know, this idea that we are founded on Judeo-Christian principles is, is just utter nonsense. I have fought that rhetorical battle for about 15 years, and I have yet to hear a new argument. I've yet to hear a good argument for it. I debunked all of them in the founding myth. Well, we, we, everyone's got two books to pick up now. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're standing in line while you're voting, these are great to read for that. Also, audiobooks. Like, go for the audiobooks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. All double speak. Yeah. I tell, I tell you, it is a reminder of two, and that is the Judeo Christian ethic that uh, was promoted by nope. the founding fathers, not all in one No, that's not true. I mean, again, <laughs> that, again, see the founding myth. And I'm not talking about like, all the founding fathers were atheists or all of them were deists or all of them were Christian. I think that argument is beside the point, And I encourage people not to engage on that ground because it suggests that their personal religious beliefs had an impact on the founding of the United States, and they didn't because they found it more important to separate church and state. So their personal religious beliefs don't actually factor into any of the calculus. And when we engage on that ground, we actually make a mistake. The Judeo-Christian ethic is, first of all, not a thing. Like, the Judeo-Christian no. is just not a thing. It's a thing they're making up. That phrase is meant to blunt the edge of a deliberately exclusionary movement, right? The, the entire point of Christian nationalism is to make it so that conservative white Christians are a special favorite class and everybody else is second class citizens. And one way to avoid <laughs> seeming like that's what you're trying to do is to adopt some, you know, fig leaves to cover up that exclusionary movement. And, and the Judeo in Judeo-Christian is just such a fig leaf. I watch Ken Ham more than anyone should. I also enjoy that he pulls it out in an ambiguous manner so that each person watching can fill in their own blanks of what they think the Judeo-Christian ethic means. Yeah. Does it mean working hard? Does it mean believing in Jesus? Could mean racism. Could mean all the thing, yeah. bigotry. You just fill in your own blank and Ken gets to say, no, I didn't say that. That's a frustrating thing for me that he plays on that ambiguity to allow whatever but ultimately that judeo-christian ethic has its basis in the bible so if you think america was founded on the bible don't put the judeo-christian ethic in between there as a bridge to just say it's founded on the bible and then point to the bible verse on which america is right. built do that for me point to the spot in the records of the constitutional convention which we have when the framers were debating every aspect of the constitution Point to me where they invoked the Bible and said, you know what we should do is what they say about government in Kings, first Kings, right. second, like there, there's no whiff of representative government in the Bible. It's all about monarchies that are theocracies, right? I mean, which is exactly what the founders were rebelling against when they drafted it. I mean, just point to me, Ken, <laughs> in the Bible where... It says we, the people, should be the basis of a government instead of God, as in Romans 13, right? There's just a fundamental disconnect here. And by the way, this, again, this is the focus of my first book, The Founding Myth. I utterly ripped this to shreds in there. If you're not on about the word of God, um, then ultimately it'll collapse, right? <laughs> right. And what, what has happened is we have whole, ge whole generations go through an education system that's showing God out, the Bible out, that, you know, man determines truth. Once you get rid of the Bible altogether, then there's no basis hey, in for the Judeo-Christian ethic. <laughs> Got a little something right there, but I, was, I mean, like this always just, this blows me away. The hatred and vitriol directed at our public school system in the United States is really something. A lot of the roots of modern Christian nationalist movement date back to desegregation, to the decision in Brown versus Board of Education when the Supreme Court, before it was captured and packed by folks like Leonard Leo and Donald Trump, actually said, yes, public schools cannot be segregated on the basis of race. And then you start to see a lot of these modern Christian nationalist movements have their roots in that moment. Private school vouchers were invented as a way oh. to get around Brown versus Board of Education. School choice movement began as a way to get around Brown versus Board of Education. All I get all of this like, detail in the last few chapters of American Crusade. It really is. I mean, the moral majority, Jerry Falwell, Paul Weyrich, when they decided that they were going to choose abortion as the wedge issue to divide the American electorate, they were making that decision because they knew that standing on their racist segregationist beliefs was no longer going to be politically popular. Right. They had to choose a different issue. That's why abortion 
is the issue that it is in this country. It's got its roots in racism, in segregation, in Brown versus Board of Education. The, the, the attempt to undermine and destroy our public school system that you hear being echoed all the way down through Ken Ham's and out of his mouth right now. It's as if racists are, you know, putting their hand inside him and making his mouth move and say all these things about how awful our public schools are because they have white and black kids learning together side by side. Not that he's not incentivized enough, but he is the number one selling homeschool curriculum in the country. So anything to undermine public schools is going to go directly to his pocket and not just indirectly. I did not know that. Well, wow. it's scary. Yeah. And it's by God's grace, we're seeing small victories like this. And with that in mind, bear in mind that the last line of the article is this, the U.S. Supreme Court is set to hear a similar case next term. So be aware of that, be praying for that. There's going to be more and more of those direction. cases that have come up. And, and that's this term. The court's going to actually hear oral argument on December 5th in that case. So I'll be listening to that. I'll be curious to see if they can distinguish between race and LGBTQ status when they're talking about discrimination. I'll be certainly listening for the speech issue because that's going to be the big one. The court is seems to be shedding the religious freedom issue in this case, though I expect it will come up somewhat in the argument as well. So we are on the precipice here. It could get ugly very soon. And again, that's oral argument. The decision won't be for several months, maybe like April, usually June is the more controversial decisions, but I don't know that the court considers this controversial anymore. And that's a scary thought. We managed to get through exactly <laughs> one story in our time together. <laughs> that's what happens when you have a lawyer on. You let, you let a lawyer bust in <laughs> and you give a lawyer a captive audience to pontificate. That's what you're going to get. So, you know, I'm not going to apologize. I love it. Fair enough. I think that is clearly enough Ken Ham for one day for both of us. Sounds good. All right. If you haven't already picked up your copies of Andrew's newest books, American Crusade, How the Supreme Court is Weaponizing Religious Freedom, and The Founding Myth, Why Christian Nationalism is Un-American, do yourself and your country a favor and check the links in the description, including how to get a signed copy of American Crusade for a limited time from his website, andrewlsidel.com. And don't forget to vote in the midterms. Thanks for watching, and until next time, Later.